Okay, so we're going to put <clears throat> some of these concepts into a more clinical context. The first five deal with different disorders that are caused by genetic differences. <clears throat> so we'll start with Lisa. Lisa has a brother with cystic fibrosis. It's an autosomal recessive disorder. So we have learned about autosomal recessive disorders. Any of these case studies we might revisit when we come to other units of content, but for now we're just going to focus on what an autosomal recessive disorder is and what the nurse's role in dealing with a patient at risk for passing on that trait. She has recently discovered that she's pregnant. She has many questions. We have a case study on Michael. Michael has Marfan syndrome, an autosomal dominant disorder that affects connective tissue. He and his wife already have one child and they are planning another pregnancy. Um, so that is a discussion of autosomal dominant disorders. Brianna is a 37 year old woman who gives birth unexpectedly to a child with trisomy 21. This is a disorder of aneuploidy. Um, so we'll kind of discuss her case. Maud. Maud is actually based on a patient that I had several weeks ago. She had prenatal testing indicating that her child had mosaic trisomy 16, a disorder of aneuploidy, but it only affected some of the cells and not others. We don't know how many. So that's Maud's case. And we have James. This should say Division I college team. Um, James is planning on playing football for Division I college team. He has questions about a mandated test for sickle cell trait. So we'll get started. I'll break these out into separate videos so that none of them take more than 15 minutes to discuss. But we have Lisa. There's Lisa. So young. She's about 19. Lisa's a 19-year-old woman. She's a freshman studying biology at the local university. You are the nurse caring for her 15-year-old brother, Will, who has cystic fibrosis. William has had many hospital stays on your pediatric pulmonary unit. You are at a large teaching facility. We could say it's CHOP, but really it's a pediatric hospital. It's a tertiary care center. Lisa visits her brother frequently. You have developed a good relationship with her, so she trusts you enough to tell you stuff. One afternoon, Lisa sees you in the hallway and asks you if you have a moment to talk with her privately. This happens to be a good time, so you find a private place and sit down. Lisa confides in you that she has just discovered that she is pregnant. She is concerned that the baby will have cystic fibrosis. Lisa also tells you that the father of the baby is not involved and she doesn't think she can handle a child with severe illness at this time in her life. She has not told her parents that she is pregnant and she has not yet seen a provider for prenatal care. Okay, as a nurse, sometimes you field questions from people who aren't your patients and you are expected to be a reliable source of information. And this is what's happening in this scenario. So Lisa asks you, what are the odds of my baby having cystic fibrosis? Here's a little NCLEX style question. You know that cystic fibrosis is an autosomal recessive disorder. What is an accurate response? And this is where those little Punnett squares can come in handy, but maybe let's see what happens. So we have option one, the odds are 50% your child will be a carrier and 50% that your child will have the disease. Option two, both you and the baby's father would have to be tested to see if you are CF carriers to know what the chances of your baby having CF are. Option three, since you have no symptoms of cystic fibrosis, it is not possible for your child to have cystic fibrosis. And option four, this disorder happens because of faulty duplication during meiosis. You are not at increased risk for passing on the disease. Which one of these options describes accurate information in relation to what you know about Lisa and what you know about autosomal recessive disorders? C. The uh, correct option was two. Cystic fibrosis is due to a recessive allele on the CFTR gene. CFTR, um, that gene codes for a protein that regulates the flow of water in and out of cells through a chloride channel. We test for it typically if 
a child shows symptoms. Now, this was before we had newborn screening, tested everybody um, with a sweat test. You had more chloride in your, or yeah, chloride ions in your sweat. An individual who has cystic fibrosis got one allele for this variant, this abnormal gene that codes for the wrong protein, um, got one allele from each parent. And so William is homozygous, recessive. That is why he has cystic fibrosis, the disease. Lisa's parents were both asymptomatic carriers. We don't know Lisa's status as a carrier, but she's more likely to be one because the odds of her being one were 50% when her parents conceived her. If both she and the father of the baby are carriers, the odds of this fetus having cystic fibrosis, having that alteration on the CFTR gene are 25%. But if we don't know whether she's a carrier and we don't know dad's status, we can't really predict with any security, the chances that this child will have both copies of that allele. Lisa seems confused about this. It's a lot of science, even though she's a biology major and she's stressed, so we'll give her some grace. She volunteers that she knows she's running out of time to make a decision. You ask her about her understanding of cystic fibrosis. She tells you that all she knows is what she has seen her brother go through and that the disease runs in families. To which resources or professionals can you direct her? So think about that for a minute. Sort of get a picture in your head of who could tell her more about cystic fibrosis. Certainly as a pediatric nurse, you could discuss the advancements in care, the longer lifespans that most children have, universal screening of newborns for cystic fibrosis that um, give people a better chance at successful treatment. Um, and the fact that people are now living into their 40s and 50s from a disease that used to kill children, usually prior to adolescence. Um, we don't know that, that that 40 and 50 is the end point because those people haven't lived long enough. We haven't had those advances long enough to see just how successful our treatment for CF can go. But I will tell you that I have had a patient um, who, had this, who had cystic fibrosis she successfully had a baby through um, pregenetic. She had a donor egg um, and her husband's sperm with pregenetic testing and successfully completed a pregnancy and gave birth to a healthy baby. So people are living longer. It's not quite as dire as it used to be, but all Lisa knows is that her brother's been in the hospital a lot. It stresses her parents. It causes financial strain. It, uh, it has been a stressor. And she knows she's doing this alone um, at the age of 19 with her educational and career goals not completed. So this might be a little bit outside your expertise. In this conversation, Lisa reveals that her last menstrual period was about eight weeks ago. So we're already out of organogenesis if we're eight weeks pregnant. She tells you she'll probably keep the baby if she knows that it's healthy, but that she will probably terminate the pregnancy if testing reveals that it has CF. She tells you that testing the father of the baby is not an option because he's not answering phone calls and he won't return her text messages. She asks you about options for fetal testing, insurance coverage, and whether she will obtain results in time to secure an abortion if they are positive for cystic fibrosis. Now let's pause here for a moment because like most Americans or almost all Americans, you probably have strong feelings in one direction or the other about the right of a woman to terminate pregnancy versus the right of a fetus to have that pregnancy continued. That's okay. Nobody's telling you what to think or believe. You are absolutely entitled to have values and to act in a way that's consistent with those values. You never have to be obligated as a nurse to make a moral choice that you feel is wrong. However, <clears throat> if this conversation causes spiritual distress and it causes you to violate the nursing code of ethics, which is to um, not discriminate against anybody, regardless of their reason for seeking your care, 
regardless of the things that got them in this health condition in the first place, regardless of their health behaviors or choices, then you need to step back, examine those feelings, and go back to that ANA code of ethics so that you can be um, providing care in a way that's consistent with what our profession tells us to do. So if you were the nurse in this scenario and this conversation was disturbing to you, how would you reconcile this conflict? How could you respect your own beliefs and values and still support this patient? Well, remember in this scenario, you are not Lisa's nurse, strictly speaking, although you are a nurse, that is why she's coming to you. Um, you do not have to counsel her on whether terminating her pregnancy is the right choice or the wrong choice. What nurses are called on to do is to listen, to offer factual information, and to allow people the right to make their decisions within you know, what's medically and legally available to them. So after examining your feelings about the subject, you realize that even the factual information about her question is sort of outside your wheelhouse. Um, so now we need to again refer Lisa. So in the last few slides, I've been sort of gearing you towards who can give Lisa these answers. Well, ideally, she needs to go for prenatal care as soon as possible. She is already eight weeks pregnant. Um, there may be other risk factors that she has for this pregnancy should she decide to continue it. Um, she can get answers from the Cystic Fibrosis Organization. She can get answers from a genetic counselor. And really, most importantly, the starting point should be an OBGYN who's capable of either giving prenatal care or referring her to somebody who can um, help her get the care that she desires and needs. So at this point, she also has some social issues. Father of the baby is not in contact, um, which creates a situation of its own. She is young, she is unmarried. Um, all of which, you know, you're not a social worker, but maybe you want her to see somebody who is a little more equipped to deal with her many issues. And we're going to kind of cut this off here, make a new video with a new case study, and that will be Michael. Just a little sneak peek at Mike. Um, so see you in a few minutes.